Amen. Hey, if you have your Bible, go to the Gospel of Mark, chapter number eight. Mark, chapter eight. I want to talk to you this morning on the topic faith culture. And I'm going to preach this, and then right at the end of that, we're going to have an amazing time of celebrating people's public confession of their faith in Christ. How many know this is the best service to come to at Gateway Church? Amen. So Mark chapter 8, we'll be reading there in just a second. Uh, to kick this off, I want to tell a story, and sometimes when I'm telling stories, it's, it's hard to come up with new stories because I'm not a preacher that lies and makes up stories. <laughs> so I want to tell stories that are applicable to something I'm going to be sharing, and, and I've shared this one uh, once before, but it's something that's so fitting for what we're talking about. I wanted to share it with you. Um, some months ago, I was in... Uh, La Rivera, how many know the Lord meets with us at La Rivera and we get to have great food there, great queso dip, it's amazing. And so I was over there and I was having a bad day, man. I was having a really bad day. Anybody had a really bad day before, like where everything's going wrong, it seems like. And so it was one of those days, just a, a struggling day, a challenging day. And I was sitting there eating my cheese dip and I got up to go pay. And as I'm going to pay, this lady just cuts right in front of me. And I was like, the devil's a liar. This is not happening right now. I'm about to, and just to be honest with you, I'm, I'm like, as, as a pastor, I, I take it on the chin so much because people can spit in my face. And I'm like, thank you. It's so good. Thank you for being a part of Gateway. It's so great. <laughs> and, and so it's like, you know, I have that all the time. So I've got like all this pent up frustration already. It's why I shoot guns because I, I shoot targets. I shoot targets because I don't shoot people. Okay. And so I also... <laughs> I also have a punching bag because I punch a bag and not bags. And so it's one of those things where, <laughs> yeah. So it's one of those things. And so I, I, was, I was doing, I had all this frustration. And you know, you ever been in the shower and you, you fantasize about telling someone off that you want to tell off? Like, you, like you've got the speech, but you're waiting for the moment that you get to start unpacking the speech you have prepared for weeks. And so, yeah, I feel you, I feel you. And so I'm standing there in this moment and I'm like, as soon as she turns around, I'm gonna let Karen, and I say that figuratively because Karens in this church are really amazing people and we need to love, somebody go love a Karen today, okay? They need Jesus too. But I was like, I'm about to let her have it. I'm, I'm, I'm ready. As soon as she turns around, I'm going to be like, what do you think you're doing? Did you not see me standing there? I was trying to, and I was just going to let her, I was going to let her know. You know, I wasn't going to cuss, but I was just going to let her know. And, uh, and she turns around, she goes, I'm so sorry, pastor. I couldn't let you pay for your own lunch. I was wondering if that was you. How you doing, sister? And the reality is this, it's like the reason I expected something bad was the trajectory of my expectation based on the experiences I'd already had that day. And, and, and when I'm going into this message talking about a faith culture, I, I just want some of us to understand that we come to the table with an expectation that maybe isn't healthy or isn't Christ focused or isn't Christ driven, but maybe our expectation is being driven by the painful, hurtful, even traumatic experiences that we've already experienced in life. And so what happens is this, is expect our experiences in the past frames our expectation for the present, but our expectation in the present is what frames our experiences in the future. So, so it's like this, it goes, it goes, we have experiences that shape our expectation, then expectation that shapes our experiences. And it ends up being a cycle in our life if we're not careful. You ever heard someone say, I don't have, if I don't have any luck, if I have any luck, it's no luck or no luck at all, or, or, or I'm, I'm waiting for something else bad to happen, or, or like all of these things. We used to have this thing that, that my grandparents said, it always comes in threes. The only thing I didn't know comes in threes is Father, Son, Holy Ghost. I'm good. We good. Like get that superstitious juju away from me. I don't want none of that. But, but that's what, it always comes in three. It's like when somebody in the family passed away, it's like you're waiting who for the other two people are. <laughs> anybody grew up around those, anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, and I kept saying, God, don't let me be one of them. I don't want to be one of them, Lord. 
Like it creates fear in your heart. And so, and so your expectations change because of a bad past experience. And, and maybe some of you, you're in relationships now and you can't enjoy the health and beauty of what God has given you because your expectation is framed by past hurtful experiences. And it's like you almost have this thing inside you that you're just waiting on something bad to happen. I'm waiting on them to show their true colors. I'm waiting on them to, to treat me how I know everyone else has treated me. This can't be real. I'm waiting on that to happen. You, you have an expectation that is framed based on your past experiences. What I believe God wants to do is he wants to change it to under, for us to understand that our expectation can shift because the experience that we are working from is not the experience of what happened to us, but the experience of what he did for us. So in other words, the experience of him going, the finished work of the cross, changes my expectation for my future. So where I used to say, because this happened to me, now this is probably gonna happen later, I can say, well, because he took stripes on his back, I can believe that he's my healer. Because he says he would give us peace that surpasses all understanding, I can walk in peace and joy. Because he'll never leave me nor forsake me, then I can know that I'm always gonna be secure in him. Like, like there's something that we get when we start living from what he did and his scars instead of our scars. Something shifts inside of us. And, and so understanding that, I want that to be kind of a foundation stone as we look into the story in the Gospel of Mark chapter 8 to extrapolate some of the principles from this that I believe the Lord wants us to learn today and to leverage in our life for his glory and for our good. So Mark chapter 8, verse number 22. It's the story of this blind man in Bethsaida. And it says this, Then Jesus came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him, somebody say led him, out of the town. It says, and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. Somebody say look up. It says, and he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Then he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. Interesting. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you for your word. I'm asking you to help me to preach this with clarity, with conviction. God, let it be something that transforms all of our lives. Let it be engaging, even entertaining, but let it be empowering to make us more like you. If whatever I say is not of you, guard their hearts. But if what I say is from you, King Jesus, let it change all of our lives to become more like you. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen, amen and amen. So as I'm looking in this story, and as I'm reading through this, and, and we get to the first part of that, notice that this blind man had people, had uh, Jesus, had them take him to Jesus so that Jesus could touch him. Touch him. Somebody say touch. And, and that's what it, he wanted a touch. And, and I don't know if you've ever, have you ever come into church just needing a touch? Like, like I've, I've come in before and I'm like, God, it's been a hard week. I just need a touch. I need you, God, to touch. I need you to minister to me. I, I need your touch. And more can happen from your touch than a lifetime of religious zeal. But God, I just need you to do something. But there's something in this story that is interesting to me in that Jesus, when he asked for a touch, he didn't just give him a touch, but he took him by the hand and he led him. And what I believe the Lord is showing us today is that, yes, he wants to touch us. Yes, he wants us to have incredible encounters. Yes, he wants us to have amazing experiences with him. Yes, he wants us to come into church and, and leave with our cup full. That's all good things. But, but can I offer to you, if we're not careful, we build a theology of experience rather than a theology of relationship. And what I mean by that is this. If we're not careful, we think it's just one experience to another experience. And we're waiting for the next experience, not understanding that the same God that meets with me on the, in the altar on Sunday is the same God that has me by the hand leading me on Monday in whatever place I'm going, whether I'm going to work, whether I'm going to school. He's the same God with me in traffic in Murfreesboro as he is in the altar on Sunday at Gateway. Like, like yes, we need the altar. Yes, we need encounters. But we also need to understand Jesus doesn't want us to settle for a touch. He wants to lead us in relationship and to have a faith culture, a culture of faith and belief in God, we've got to have a God that is ordering our steps and leading our lives, not just a God that shows up when it's convenient for us. He wants to be your Lord. Do you know he's your healer? Absolutely. 
He's your deliverer, praise God. Like he is your salvation, but he's also your Lord. He is your king. He is your God. He is your, one, one uh, scripture in Hebrews that says he is the author and finisher of our faith. It, it also says this. It says it in a different translation. It says he is the trailblazer and the pioneer of our faith. To understand that the way of Jesus, before we were called Christians, we were called people of the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. To understand that the way of Jesus is not just a principle to be learned, but a path to be followed. That he wants to lead us and order our steps. That he wants us to move beyond a touch. And to be honest with you, I feel like, especially within more experiential churches, that if we're not careful, we have people becoming almost charismatic junkies in the sense that, and I mean that not in a disrespectful way, but if they don't feel something, then they don't know, they don't believe God's there. If they don't, they don't feel overwhelmed or they don't feel goosebumps. And, and can I just tell you that God is so much more than our feelings? That his sovereignty and his goodness and his grace is so much greater than our feelings? That, that God is with me in those moments where the fire is falling and, and we're shouting and everything is great. Like earlier in the worship set when, when they were singing, let it rain, and then Jenna came in on that part, I was just like, I was like, I'm gonna float away to heaven right now. Like this is, like, this is fantastic. But, but can I tell you that even though I love those moments and I cherish those moments, that some of my most cherished moments where I knew the presence of the Lord was there was not when I was feeling goosebumps or feeling euphoric or feeling like at any moment the heavens are going to open and we're going to heaven together. Like it wasn't that it was, it was when I felt the Lord's presence, when I was standing in the hallway, when my mother suffocated to death at the hospital, I felt the Lord's presence. It, it was, I, I, I sensed the presence of the Lord in the sense that I knew he was there. It wasn't even a feeling. I knew he was there. I, it was when I was standing over my brother's body, identifying his body that, that I knew the Lord was there even though I didn't feel it in my emotions. And so what I want to offer to you is this, is, is the kind of faith that I'm talking about. It's not a fickle faith. It's, it's not a shallow faith. It's not the kind of faith that says, well, only when we feel good or we feel high or it's a fast song and we're jumping and we're excited or it's really deep and we're crying. Like, like there may be moments where we're not jumping, we're not shouting, we're not crying, but yet the presence of the Lord is there in that moment and I can have faith to believe and trust him that he is leading me even when I don't feel it, that he is with me even when I don't feel it, that he is for me even when I don't feel it, that he is going before me in fighting battles, even when I can't see it, that I know that he is good and I know that he is present. Why? Because his word says that he will never leave me. He'll never forsake me. And I can trust in him even in my darkest moments. If you're grateful for that, would you give him praise? But we also need to see in this text that Jesus does something as he leads him. He doesn't just, just lead him anywhere. He, he leads him away from the city. Now, now, what does that mean? Well, understand, this is a blind man. And for a blind man, being in a familiar place is vitally important. Because if you can't see, it's how you navigate, is by familiarity. Anyone ever had to get up to go to the restroom in the middle of the night and you can't see? The only way you make it is by familiarity. And the moment one shoe is out of place, you almost went to heaven. The moment one Lego is out of place, you almost deserve to go to hell. <laughs> like, like, y'all know why I step on that Lego. It's like, it ain't tongues you speaking in, but you need Jesus. <laughs> and so, so like, but you, you navigate it because you know the familiarity, you know the layout of the room. So for a blind man to be led away from that shows us this powerful picture that faith oftentimes has to lead us away from what is familiar. And this is a challenge for us because we all like what is familiar. This morning I was writing this down. So this is like, this is like fresh bread from heaven right now because I wrote it this morning as I was coming into service. And I'm just going to read it the way the Lord gave it to me. And, and it was this. It was, the familiar will always try to rob you from the season and place God is taking you into now. The familiar will always have a pull and try to pull you back. And try to pull you out of what you're in. Get you to question God and his goodness in the season he has you for. And, and, and this, this, is, this is the main line. Because familiarity is counterfeit peace. And, and this, is, this is what I mean by that. Notice that Jesus leads us by peace. 
He says, he leads us beside still waters. Like, like the way I know God is leading me to something is, is I have wisdom and a multitude of counsel. I have other things, but the way I really know is I feel peace in my spirit. Like I just sense the Holy Spirit bear witness with my spirit that yes, Lord, this is the direction you're leading me in. And there are times it doesn't make sense, but I feel peace. And if I don't feel peace, I need to slow down. If I don't feel peace, I need to pump the brakes. If I don't feel peace and sense peace, and I say feel in a, in, in a loose way, not in a sense of like emotions, but that, that inner witness of the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit in your heart, you know what I'm talking about. When the Lord, he, he convicts you of stuff. He convinces you of stuff. He teaches you stuff. He speaks to you there. And when I sense that peace in my inner man, that's when I know the Lord has given me the nod of God to move forward with something. And so the thing about familiarity is it's a counterfeit peace. So much so that Israel was being led by the Lord. Think about it. Israel comes out of Egypt and, and no one was sick. Everyone was healed and, and they plunder and take the spoils of Egypt with them. They're going blessed and they're going healed and, and their, their shoes didn't even wear out. I mean, it was, their clothes didn't wear out. I mean, it was, it was amazing. There's manna raining from heaven and, and water flowing from rocks and a Red Sea that split wide open. And I'm talking about miracle after miracle after miracle of God saying, yes, this is what I told you. And yes, this is is where I'm leading you, and yes, I'm providing here, and I'm providing there, and I'm giving you sign after sign after sign after sign. After, yes, I'm with you. Only for them to say, can't we go back to Egypt? Couldn't we go back to Egypt? Is it possible for us to go back to Egypt? Because the strength and the pull of familiarity is something we vastly underestimate when it comes to our faith journey, because it is a counterfeit peace. And instead of staying in faith and pioneering the new season God has for you, there's part of you that wants to run back to the old because it's what you've always known. You ever wonder why people go back into unhealthy relationships? It's because it's what they've always known. And it's just, it's comfortable and it's safe and it's fake peace that leads them back into it. You ever wondered why people go back into addiction? It's fake peace. You ever wondered why people go back in chains and bondage? It's fake peace. You ever wondered why, Egypt, why Israel cried out for Egypt? It was fake peace. Because what happens in the faith journey is it leaves us in the tension of transition because the tension of transition necessitates relationship, not just transaction. So, so in other words, it's not just I come in, I get a touch, and I move on. I'm being led by the Lord, but I'm being led by the Lord away from what is familiar because he wants me dependent on him in life. He leads us away from what is familiar. So let, let me ask you, what is, what is familiar that you're willing to move beyond? Are you willing to, to move beyond familiar praise, beyond familiar serving or loving or obedience or a familiar mindset? Are you willing to move beyond familiar relationships? Because there's some relationships you actually need to walk away from. Because God is leading you into a place that is life-giving and kingdom-focused. And so for us, we have to make sure that we're willing to navigate this. Because do you know what? You know what familiarity really is? Again, I talked about turning the light on to navigate the bedroom. Familiarity is the tool that's used to navigate darkness. And, and the Lord doesn't want you navigating darkness anymore. He wants you walking in light. It says, his word is a lamp into my, and a light into my path. Like, like, you don't need the familiarity to navigate darkness. You are children of light. You are the light of the world, Matthew 5 says. Don't, don't put it under a, a bushel. Don't, don't hide your light. Shine your light. Reflect the light of Christ in your life and walk in the light as he is the light. Can you give him praise that he is lighting up our worlds? But then also in this faith journey and in a faith culture that we have to be willing to obey the Lord even when it doesn't make sense. How many of sometimes God will ask us to do the impractical so he can do the impossible? Yeah. Like sometimes it doesn't make sense. Like, like Jesus in the story, it says that, that he spit and he made mud and, and he rubbed it on the man's eyes. Like this right here makes absolute, if I did that, I would be all over the Shelbyville Times Gazette. Like it would be on the front page. Local pastor spits and so it would be on Facebook for sure. Man, our haters would be coming out of the woodwork. But like, but like Jesus did this and, and, and something that was powerful that I didn't share this in the first service, but someone came up to me in the second service and, and she said to me, she goes, Hey pastor, you know, another powerful thing that, that Jesus did when he spit and made the mud. I said, what? She goes for a beggar in that area. And in that time of the world, people would often walk by and spit on them. So what, what the blind man heard, which was his most dominant sense is he would have heard, oh, 
And he probably could have been waiting on someone to spit on him again to ridicule, but the Lord redeemed what that was and that, that inner healing that took place inside of him. So now that what was a sound of rejection was a sound of healing that was redeemed in the ears of this blind man. And I'm just thinking, isn't that the way Jesus works? Like the very thing that the enemy used to reject us is the very thing that God uses to heal us and to make us whole. Like that's how good God is. Can we give him praise just because he's good? But there are times God asks us to do stuff that makes absolutely no sense to us. And, and when you think about it for this blind man, it, faith is a journey of trust. And, and think about it, Jesus didn't heal him, then take him out of the city. He took him out of the city and then healed him. And that in between is what usually gets us as believers. It's that in between season, like what were you talking about? The moment from when we encounter Jesus to the place of the miracle is when we have to walk blind. Like, like how many know faith is a blind walk? And you're walking and you don't know where you're going, but you know Jesus is with you and, and you know that he's got you and, and you take your first few steps and you're kind of afraid, then you get going a little bit and you know, okay, the Lord's got me. And, and then you start thinking, though, what if I'm getting close to the edge of the stage right now? I may fall off the stage and be all over YouTube and like, it's everywhere. But like, like, then you start thinking like, no, but the Lord is with me. And how do I know that he's got me in the next step? Because he had me in the first step and he had me in the second step and he had me in the third step. And all of a sudden, as you get into this thing called life, no matter what your circumstances look like, no matter what you're walking through or what you're going through, you just know the Lord's got me. He had me then, he'll have me now, he'll have me in the future. Every place I go, the Lord is with me, never to leave me nor forsake me. But he also said this, I was young, I'm old, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread. And what that says to me is this, is that the Lord will always take care of his people. How many is grateful that God takes care of you? He's a good shepherd that leads his people, he leads us in life, but don't get caught up in the season where you have to walk blind because there's something on the other side of your faithful steps and your faithful journey, even and especially when it doesn't make sense. But something else Jesus did in this, and I think it can serve as a reminder to all of us, is he, he had the man look up. And what I'm about to say here is a little bit poetic. I, I don't ne necessarily that this is it's something, it's, it's metaphorical in a sense, symbolic. But when we see that Jesus tells him to look up, the immediate thing I thought about was he, looked, he got touched the first time and he saw people, but he saw them blurry like trees. And, and then it says he prayed again and he saw them as people, saw more clearly as he told him to look up. And then I thought about Jesus where it says Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. And I think sometimes in life, for us to walk in a faith culture with a proper faith that honors Jesus, to be people of faith, we got to continuously look up. That, that there are moments in life we can get caught up in the horizontal, and, and you know what I'm talking about, like when someone is rude to you. Like we went to, Samuel and I went last night to Buffalo Wild Wings to watch a monumental victory by the Crimson Tide. And uh, I love all y'all. Um, and so we're in there watching it, and there was some there was some Georgia fans. Any Georgia fans here? There were anybody? Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. And so they were over there, and and they were cheering, they were cheering for LSU. We were sitting by an Auburn fan. Any Auburn fans here? Okay. Good. And and they they were cheering for LSU. I'm like, how do you know you've made it with your team? Is when every other team cheers against your team. So anyway, I'm sitting there and I'm listening. Well, well, they didn't know we didn't have any gear on or anything. And the guy got up and he came over. And as he was walking out, he stood over Sam and I, and he goes, let's go LSU. And, and I'm thinking, smack him. <laughs> Just felt super disrespectful. And I was like, okay, no, can't do that. And, and then Sam and I got to talking, and we realized the guy thought we were LSU fans. Because Sam had said something right before. He said, this is a big play for LSU. And the guy heard him. Well, I didn't know he had said that. So I had to take a moment, look up, ask the Lord how to respond, but in that moment, I got to see things with more clarity and more perspective, to realize he wasn't being disrespectful, he was actually trying to encourage us. But how many times do we do this? How many times do we react in the moment, react because of emotions, react because of how it struck us, or be quick to snap at somebody, and, and we don't even know their motive, we don't know what they're doing, we don't even know the angle. I would just encourage you, pause and look up. 
Like just, just learn to Paul say, God, the same way this man the first time couldn't see people clearly, help me to see people clearly, to understand their motives, to know what they're doing, to know why they're doing it, and how I can respond to them in a way. Because the Lord said, when you pray, pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That, that I don't react to the world around me, I respond to my Father in heaven who's calling me to live redemptively. So sometimes we need that. Anybody been in traffic and have to look up a lot? Christmas shopping is coming up. Look up. When you're fighting over Elmo and the lines. I don't even know if Elmo's still a thing, but that was a thing back in the day. Fighting over an Xbox. Like make sure you pray and look up. But we need to look up to have clarity of vision for what God's calling us, to have a clarity of what God is saying to us, speaking to us, and leading us into in our life. Heaven gives you clarity when emotions cloud your judgment. Learn to look up. Last is notice that Jesus, as he was leading this man, he led him out of the city. And as he led him out of the city, it says that he looked at the man after he healed him and says, don't go back and tell them. Listen to what it says at the end. It says, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. Very specific. And, and I'm thinking, why? And again, we're talking about faith culture. And what that means at the end, I'll share with you at the end here in just a second. But listen, don't go back in the town. And, and the reason that I felt like the Lord is, was saying this is because we have to be guarded about who we share our dreams and our miracles and our big faith conversations with. Like, like not everybody is for you. Not everybody is with you. I, I can remember when we were first moving into this building, I, I called someone and I said, we're buying this Walmart. And I called one of my friends who's a faith friend and, and they're like, let's go, man. God's going to do it. God's going to feel it. Multiple services. God's going to fill that place. There's going to be revival in the middle Tennessee area. You're going to get to be a part of it. And I'm like, Yes. How many know we need friends like that? They just gas you up for Jesus. I felt like running through a wall, man. I was like, I was so excited. And I called another friend and I was like, hey man, look, I just got the phone with so-and-so and God's doing this and look what he's doing and God's so amazing, God's so incredible. He goes, well, yeah, but. You know, I had a friend that, that bought a Lowe's building in Nashville and uh, put his church in it and it closed within a year because they didn't estimate the utilities being what they were. And so I just hope you're not the guy that goes to an almost 80 year old church and has it shut down within a year because you got too big for your britches and went out and bought something you shouldn't buy. Just, I'd love you bad enough to tell you the truth. Okay, um, have a good one. Like, like how many know people can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. So I don't question the brother's motives. I question his faith. Like, like I get it, wisdom and multitude of counsel, but, like, but make sure it's good counsel. And so when, because what faith is, is I want you to get this. Faith is not me demanding God to do something. Faith is me responding to his word and to his promise. So, so in other words, I, I didn't walk out and it wasn't faith that got, got us in this building, it was a response to God saying, I want you to have this building and use it for my glory. And I said yes to him. That's my faith. And I think sometimes we think faith is like us controlling God to manipulate him to get what we want to do. When I would offer to you, I believe faith at its purest form is a response to the leadership of the Holy Spirit and the word of God in our lives. That, that it's, and listen, the faith message was perverted for a long time where it was people like, I declare and decree, I've got a Bentley. God gave me four of them, Ryan Bentley and the whole family. Like, I've got a Lamborghini. Like, I can walk up here, I got a Lamborghini, I got a Lamborghini. It doesn't mean I got a Lamborghini. If you got one you want to donate, that's totally cool, but like, I, I mean, I have that. I could say this I have abs, I have abs, I have abs. I declare and decree that I have abs. But until I cut my calories and increase my activity, I don't have abs, okay? So, so this is the thing, and hear what I'm saying with this. Faith is not a tool to excuse our laziness and our selfishness, to use God and manipulate him to give us what our selfish appetites are. That's not faith. Faith is a response to the heart and leadership of the Lord as we move forward in life with the right heart and motivation 
that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven and that he gets all the glory, not us. Amen? Can we give him praise this morning? But you have to be careful who you have these conversations with. Maybe God's doing something in your life and there's people that if we're not careful, especially if you're a highly influ like easily influenced person, like you gotta be careful who you share your faith stories with because they will try to rain on it really quick. And we live in a culture of doubt and cynicism and unbelief and skepticism is all around and people just don't believe and they're looking. And the reason they're that way is because to be honest, the church got kind of kooky there for a moment. And we did some things that weren't really biblical. And we did some things that weren't real faith. And because of that, people have a posture that they have. And I understand it. But what we can't allow to do is failed, bankrupt experiences of our church's past and history to cause us to quit believing wholeheartedly what the word of the Lord says is true and what the Lord says yes to. If he says yes, I say yes. If he says no, I say no. If he says believe for it, I'm going to believe for it. If he says he's healer, I'm declaring he's healer. If he says he's deliverer, I'm believing he's deliverer. If he says he's He's Savior. He can save anybody. If he says he can cleanse me and sanctify me, I am cleansed and sanctified. If he says he's made us holy as he is holy, let's walk in the holiness that he has given us. If he says that I'm giving you the Walmart building for my glory, thank you for the Walmart building. If he says Middle Tennessee's in revival, thank you, Lord, that Middle Tennessee's in revival. I'm going to believe what the word of the Lord is, not just what the appetite of Jason is. The way I would say it is this, and this is, this is my prayer for us as a church. My prayer for us as a church is that we would be able to walk with a posture of humility and transparency before the Lord, to be honest with our struggles, to say, God, I believe, like this father in scripture, I believe, but help my unbelief. I believe that's the, that verse is the most relatable verse to me in my life. I am an overthinker. I'm analytical. I, I pick things apart. I'm, I'm, I'm like a armchair philosopher. Like I always want to have deep conversations and people are just like, really, bro? Like I want to talk about the existential reality of why we are the way we are today. And I'm like, oh, sorry. So because of that, I overthink. And I'm like, well, what about this? And what about that? And what about this? And what about that? And what about this? And can I tell you something? There's sometimes I just have to say, Jesus, I'm, I bring all my questions to you. I, I bring all these things. And, and Lord Jesus, there are doubts swirling in my heart right now. And I don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to make it go away. I just know to bring it to you because I trust you. And I know that you can help me with this. So I believe. I'm choosing to believe. No matter how I feel, I'm choosing to believe. But will you please help my unbelief? And can I tell you, God smiles at that. Way more than me trying to fake it. Like I'm a man of faith and power and I've got it all figured out and, and I know everything there is to know and, and I have no, I've never doubted a day in my life. I've never questioned anything in my life. And, and if we're not careful, we become like, like spiritual peacocks and we're trying to like flood our stuff all around here and just be like, look how spiritual I am. Look, and that's, that doesn't impress the Lord. Our pageantry doesn't impress him. Our humility and our honesty and our transparency, the Lord meets us right in the middle of that when we say, God, I'm choosing to trust you even when I don't feel it. So to have a culture of faith, I'm not saying fake it more. I'm saying be honest more. I'm saying have the conversations with God. I'm saying, Lord, help us with our unbelief. Help us to believe what you're saying. And what will happen is it'll be one step after another step, just like the blind man, of us building trust and equity with the Lord to know that we're strengthening our faith muscle in our heart to say, God, the more I trust you and believe, the more I see I can trust you and I can believe. And what I can tell you is this, is there is not one time, even when God didn't answer the way I asked him to, there is not one time he has let me down. There's no, and again, I, I know that's a heavy statement. Let me down in the sense of what I wanted, yes. Let me down in the sense of forsaking me and, and, and not caring for me and not caring me, never, not one time. He has been with me every single step of the way, whether it was mountaintops of joy or whether it was the valleys of despair and me being absolutely broken before the Lord. He has always been there for me. He will always be there for you. If he's been there for you, would you give him praise this morning? So I don't, know, I don't know what the future looks like, and, and this is, as a pastor, I feel the urgency of the Lord to share this with you. I don't know whether we, we have 
greater trials and tribulations when those go into place. I do know that it's happening even around the world right now. We have brothers and sisters, as I'm preaching this message, that are giving their life for the gospel. They're laying their life down. They're being killed, some of them tortured. And, and listen, I, I get it. Somebody may unfollow you on, on Instagram. That is not persecution. Sometimes it's a favor. That, that's not, and, and I know it may feel socially ostracized at times. The, the world hates us. You ever notice they're, they're all inclusive with everybody except for Christians? They claim that we're the judgmental ones, but we're the ones receiving the judgment. I mean, it's just weird. You know why? Because it's the father, the devil that is driving that. So we need to understand we have the one answer. His name is Jesus. So the enemy does not like that and is against that. And we live in a culture of hate against Christ. But that means we have to have a faith that's unwavering, that can be like Job that says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That can be like the Hebrew boys that says, our God will deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow to you, Nebuchadnezzar. We are going to be faithful to Yahweh. We've got to have the tenacity and a culture of faith that's preparing our sons and our daughters for a world that is post-Christian in America and they do not like them. They are hated and ridiculed to face and endure to the end so they can follow Christ until his coming. If you believe that, would you give him praise? <laughs> Faith isn't just the yes of God. Faith is trusting when you hear the no of God and to know that he still has your good. And he has your future in front of him. Would you stand to your feet all around the house? I'm going to pray. And after I pray here, and I'm going to pray with you. And after that, I'm going to address you. And then I'll invite the people to come in for baptism. But just ask you to bow your heads for a moment. Because I really do, with all of my heart, sense the Lord is working in this place right now. If you would say this morning, Pastor Jason, I don't know Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and the Lord has brought me here for such a time as this, and, and I believe that, that he wants to save me, and I want him to be my Lord and Savior. I want him to wash away my sins, or maybe you've grown distant and disconnected, and, and you just want to restore right fellowship with the Lord, and you say, I just want to come home. Whether you want to be saved or you want to come home, right now is the time, and the way you can do that is just by responding. Just if you would lift your hand to say, I want to be saved right now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, thank you. Come on, family, can we praise God for about these eight or nine hands that just went up? I'm gonna pray with you in just a moment, so, so just know that's coming. But my second question is this, and you can keep your eyes up, this is fine. If you would say today, Pastor Jason, I believe, but I'm asking the Lord to help my unbelief. That I want to move past the draw of familiarity and comfort and pseudo false peace to lean into the true peace of the Lord, to follow him in my life, to have faith to trust him in my life, to, to not just settle for a touch, but for him to lead and order my steps, to be radically obedient and to walk in a posture of trust and faith. If that's you and you say, I already believe, but God help my, I just wanna to come to you honestly today. Give me a greater measure of faith to trust you, Lord. Would you just raise your hand right now and say, that's me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Can we say this prayer together? I'm asking everyone just to say this with me if you would. Say, Jesus, I love you so much. Thank you for saving me. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I repent of my sins and I will follow you all the days of my life. Jesus, I believe, but help my unbelief. Help me to trust even when I don't feel it. Help me to believe even when it looks impossible. You are so good and I trust you today and I'll trust you forever. In Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. Can we give him praise in the house? How many is ready for some baptisms this morning? Amen. 
So what we do is we're going to start worshiping and we're going to invite those in for baptism to come on in. And this is what we want you to do. When they go down in the water and when they come, come up out of the water, let the first thing they hear when they come out of the water is their brothers and their sisters shouting and celebrating their new life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Give them a hand as they come as we start worship and we get ready to start baptism.